Monroe Jackson here from Caution R Step Play, and today I am going to be talking about Derwent Ink Tents. And basically, this is just going to be a video for people who are kind of new to the medium or beginners who are more interested in finding out the, the main techniques that can be used for this medium and I this was a really requested project so I want to talk about the different ways to use the pencils the different ways to use the blocks and then after I'd like to do a sample project using both now I do want to put out a disclaimer that you don't have to have both they're both very versatile and so I'll talk a little bit about that as well and also, I do want to mention that some of the pencils were sent to me by Derwent. However, I already also owned a full set beforehand, and I bought the blocks myself. So this video was not sponsored by Derwent. They're not paying me to do this. I am doing this because it was requested by some of you. So I want to show you, this is the paper that I'm using. You can tell it's a well-loved pad. Um, it's the Strathmore Mixed Media 400 series, and so it's pretty thick. It is 184 pounds and it's just a mixed media surface. It's really good. I love this paper. I use it a lot for ink tents, but one of my other favorite papers to use with it is the Arches Hot Press watercolor paper. Now, I want to mention normally if I were doing a full project on this paper, I would tape all the way around to try and help prevent some buckling. But since I am just doing some small things on here, I didn't bother taping all the way around. But if you're working on a finished project, I recommend taping your paper down and to tape all the edges. So I want to show you kind of what I have here. These are my pencils. I keep them in wooden drawers. I have um, at least another drawer of these. Like I said, I have the full 72 set. Derwent also sent me a set. These are not all the colors in the 72 set, though. I looked at the Light Fast ratings from the Colored Pencil Society of America. I can't disclose the ratings. You have to be part of Colored Pencil Society of America in order to see those ratings. However, I go according to their ratings, and I, I weeded out the ones that are supposed to be fugitive. That's the word I'm looking for. So I also have the 72 set of blocks and those I just keep right in the same thing, but I also weeded out the non-light fast ones as well. Ink tents come in pan form as well, but I don't have those because I use my blocks like I use watercolor pans. So I didn't bother buying any of the pans because I didn't really need to because I use my blocks that way anyways. So, all right, let's get started. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what ink tents are. And I'm going to start swatching. I'm not going to do every color, but I want to show you. Ink tents are basically colored pencils that are water soluble. Very similar to watercolor pencils. However, when you activate them with water, they wash out to an ink-like consistency. So they are more vibrant and supposed to be more permanent. So I have a Derwent watercolor pencil here as well in a similar color, and I'll just show you the difference. So you can lay these and the ink tents down, obviously, like regular pencils, and there are times that I do use them as regular pencils. So I'm just gonna put watercolor here. It's probably not the proper way to swatch. Normally I would do, you know, the typical swatch but I was just kind of hatching to show you that you can get fine lines with these so I'm just going to put ink here for ink tents and I typically use um, I use really cheap brushes but anything I use a lot of Taclon brushes and any type of watercolor brush will work with these so this is the ink tents you see how like vibrant that is I'm not really trying to do any kind of gradient here, obviously, because I had swatched it all the way. But this is just to kind of show you the difference between the two. So that's what the ink tents looks like. And now we're going to go in. Now, mind you, these are not the same exact color. But if you look, 
The ink tents kind of wash out a little bit more easily, I find. I love both products, by the way, so I'm not knocking the watercolor pencils. But it, you know, I have a harder time washing out some of the lines from the watercolor pencils. Now, one of the claims is that the Derwent ink tents don't lift as easily as the watercolor pencils. Now, there is kind of a disclaimer there because it depends on how much water to ink tents you have because they can be lifted if you haven't washed it out completely. But if you look, this is the end you haven't let it dry completely. Like it does come off a little bit because I haven't really let it dry completely. So there is times when you can correct your mistakes. So that's good. Like it's not necessarily a bad thing, but they definitely don't lift nearly as bad as the watercolor pencil. Like I was able to lift that completely off. So they definitely are more permanent, especially when you layer them and you thin them out completely with water and you let them dry thoroughly. That, that amount of lifting that I was able to do there was mostly because I didn't wait for the swatch to dry as much. So let's talk more about the Derwent Inktense pencils themselves. Now that we've kind of seen, there's obviously more color payout because it's an ink instead of regular watercolor. There's more lifting with the watercolor pencil. So that's kind of the difference there. And, but they work very similarly in other ways. So if you have worked with watercolor pencils before, then you will be able to work with these. And so something else that I wanted to talk about was a few of the techniques you can do. So I'm going to start with the pencil and I'm going to show you just a few of my favorite techniques. So obviously you have seen that you can do the typical, you know, coloring. And then, you know, wash it out. That's a horrible circle. That is just horrendous. We're going to say that that's a blueberry because they're not a perfect circle. We'll go with that. Um, so you can do your typical, you know, shading. Very similar to a regular colored pencil, actually. Like, if you really wanted to, you could continue using these as a regular colored pencil. And I do use these sometimes as regular colored pencils, but usually for later layers. So normally I like to work with lighter layers, which is not technically what I'm doing here because I'm just showing you some techniques. Um, I like to work with lighter layers and then I come on top and use them dry for detail. So I'm starting in the lightest area and I'm kind of pushing that pigment to the area that's darkest to get that shading. And that's very similar to working with regular watercolor pencils and regular watercolors. You want to start light and go dark just to kind of get that variation in there. So, you know, it's very similar working with this as it is watercolors. That is very, very messy. And normally I would work probably flatter than this, but notice how there's that ridge there and it's staying right where I put the water. So again, that's very, very similar to, to watercolor. So that's, you know, you can, you can have your object, color it in, wash it out. And then if you want it to be darker, once it's dry, you can come back in because I'll show you what happens when something is wet and you use the pencil. You get a very, very dense, dark, thick line because a lot of pigment comes off here. Now, this can be both an advantage and a disadvantage. It's an advantage when you do it purposely. This is why it's good to play with your materials and know them well before you start really using them because you can use this to an advantage if you want to create really dense line work or if you want to create a certain texture. But if you're just going in there because you're being impatient, then it could potentially cause an issue with your drawing that would be very, very difficult to remove. So you want, if you're not looking for that, you want to let your layers dry before going in with your pencil and even your blocks. Let me see if I got, I don't know if I have this, I know I have the same color block, but. And each of these, I should mention, each of these have the name on them and it has a number. You can buy these open stock. This is the 1830. You can buy these open stock, but if you look, that goes on really dense too when it's wet. See how dark that gets? Again, if you want to use that to your advantage, you can, 
but it can be really freaky when it happens when you're not looking for it. So just be aware of what effects you're looking for. If you want nice, beautiful layers and you don't want these jarring lines in there, then you need to let everything dry first. And that is something that is great about these. They do layer really well. This part's kind of dry. Let me see if it's dry enough for me to layer. With a light touch, similar to regular colored pencil, I usually go in with a light touch. A little usually goes a long way with these because they're so pigmented. So it doesn't take a whole lot to get that color payout. So keep that in mind as well. See, I was just able to layer again, and I'm going to let this dry again and maybe come in with a different color so I can show you the layering. And this effect is something that can be done with the block as well. So something that's one of my favorite things to do with these is to let the line work do the work for you. So I'm going to show you a little bit of an example. This is one of my favorite things to do with these pencils. If I wanted to, say, draw some water, and this is going to be the wonkiest horizon line, I'm going to give you... I'm going to make you seasick because I can't draw straight lines, apparently. Okay, so say this is the horizon line. Do light lines here. Because it's further away. And then closer together because it's water so the further away it gets the lines will get but I'm using a lighter touch and then as I get down here I'll use more again this isn't going to be perfect it's just an example so you know we're just drawing waves like we would with colored pencil we're gonna let those waves do the work for us maybe some darker ones in here now those lines are not gonna stay perfect take a wet brush a wet clean brush And now your ocean is already colored in for you. This is one of my favorite things to do, and it's a great way to create water. And then you see how there's like those little waves in there already, and it's lighter as it gets further away, and the waves get bigger. And then if you want to come in once it's dry, you can add more lines right over it to bring those out. And you can even add other colors in if you want. I'm really being monochromatic with this part of things. But this is one of my favorite things. And like, look, while it's still wet, here I am putting those darker lines in because I know it's still wet. But I this time, I'm not pushing hard because you don't need to. Because I don't want to damage the paper either. If you push hard, it will get right into the paper when it's still wet. So it's really just letting it bounce off and adding more details in if you want. I mean, obviously, it's not the most beautiful scenic thing we've ever done, but this is a great technique for using waters, and I've done landscapes with these pencils before, and that was my favorite way to create water. And when you'd use the lighter lines in the back, it's making it so there's less pigment there, which is perfect because as you get closer to the horizon line, like this line here at the top shouldn't be as dark as it is. That was, you know, a mistake on my part. But the lighter the lines up here, the lighter the water will be because there's not as much pigment spilling over from those lines. And so then, the closer to the horizon it gets, the lighter the water also gets as well. And then you can come back in and darken these waves with more layers after. And you can be somewhat messy with these because the lines wash out really well. And if you want to, you can use masking fluid with them. So... If you say you want to mask out a few of the the waves ahead of time because they were going to be um, white, use masking fluid. I'm using a Molotow masking fluid pen. It's just much easier on me. It's very convenient. I'll link everything in the description below in case you're interested. So see how this is kind of scratchy because I went in while it was wet. But I can continue to darken it. So it gives the illusion of waves. And then... That's not really dry enough yet. We'll come back to the masking part and I'll show you that after. Okay, so some of the other things that you can do if you have the pencils or the blocks is you can 
I recommend doing this on a plastic palette instead because it will sink into your paper. But if you really, if you say this is all you have, say all you have is some pencils, some ink tense pencils, and some paper. You can use your paper as a palette. It's just you're going to lose some of the pigment. But you can lift and then put it somewhere else. Maybe right over those lines. I don't know how. As long as you you work quickly before it dries, because it doesn't really reactivate the same way as watercolor does, as we've talked about before, it doesn't lift as easily, it doesn't reactivate as easily. But when you have a lot of pigment there, it does allow you to reactivate, because I haven't washed out all this pigment yet. So we can do that as well. The pencils are very, very versatile. So something else that I also like to do, obviously, like I said, is if you have a plastic palette, so this one, <laughs> this one is made by Karen Dash, and this is made to work with wet media, but I got it for free and I didn't know what it was made for and I used it for acrylic and I kind of ruined it, but I can still use it. It still works. It's just, that's why it looks so messy. So don't do what I did if you ever get this palette. It has a smooth side and it has a rough side, and this is actually supposed to be used with the Karen Dash neo colors which are their water soluble crayons but it works really well for ink tents as well so it's got this rough side here and you color your pencil on that and then and that's giving us a lot more of a color payout and something else that you can do is you can actually save your pencil shavings from it or you can shave your pencils off. So you can shave your pencils, you know, if you wanted to, and save the shavings. And this is the same for the blocks as well. See these little shavings. I don't know why my auto autofocus doesn't want to work. But you just got to be careful because the brush will pick up the shavings and you see these little dark marks. But it can be done and you can actually, if you do it in a different plastic palette, which, you know, one that has wells, then you can wash it down so you don't have those little chunks in it. So that's something else to keep in mind. So there's many, many ways that you can use the pencils. And how I typically use them is I do light washes. Let me see, is that dry? Let's get that masking fluid off. I didn't let this dry enough. Usually this masking fluid comes off a lot more easily and it's a lot prettier than that. But I like to do my light washes and I usually do multiple light washes to get it to, you know, where I like it to be. And then I come in with my pencils, dry, and do my details that way. This is not beautiful, but I think it's demonstrating my point, if my camera would focus. Okay, hopefully this will stay in focus. I don't know what's going on. My lighting, even though it's in the same spot as usual, seems to be off today, and my camera doesn't want to focus. I don't know what's going on. I'm really trying. I'm sorry. So, I've let this dry a little bit longer, and then I can come in with my details with my colored pencils. Well, with my ink tense pencils as colored pencils. So they're a very, very versatile tool. So the other thing is sometimes erasing isn't the easiest. It kind of smears it a little. That's something to, you know, be aware of. But if you really, if you have great paper, once it's washed out, you are able to erase. But again, you just want to be sure with it and again this is um this is my favorite castell like precision eraser that i'm using here so let's take another color and layer it over that blue and see what it does and then we can move on to the blocks these are just a few of my favorite things to do with these my favorite techniques there are many more um i recommend it just playing around with them and seeing what works best for you and your style but these are some tips to try and get you started and obviously, it depends on what kind of paper you have as well. The better the paper, the more layers you'll be able to get. But now that this is dry, I can go in like a regular colored pencil and then leave it dry and just color 
like a regular colored pencil. A lot of times, like I said, letting the lines do the work for you is really beneficial. And that comes in handy when you do other shapes as well, not just water. You can... This is not the best leaf. If you want a simple kind of style. And then you can come in and darken your lines again after. If you want it really dark, you can come in when it's wet. Some people like to dip the nib, and I've actually even seen it suggested before um, by a lot of other artists. They like to take, I call it a nib. <laughs> this isn't a marker. Um, the core, they like to dip that in water and it can give the same effect. If you ever try that, I would recommend make sure that you are not putting the wood part in the water. Now, Derwent uses like really good, strong wood casing. Like they're, they're a high quality company, but you still don't wanna be getting that wet because over time it can deteriorate the wood. So that's just something to keep in mind. But yeah, so now you have a simple little leaf using just one color you can get a, a range of values. And if I want one side to be darker, I can color it in. I could leave it like that because that texture kind of lends itself well to a leaf. Or I can come back in and wet it down again. Look how that layers. And those lines still stay there. So, especially for illustrative styles, let, let the line work do the work for you. That's what's really great about this. So let's start talking about the blocks. Now the blocks are the same product, but obviously in block form. So they're broader. They're like a pastel. And they feel similar to a pastel. If you look at that, it comes off on my hand. And you can, there are some people that like to use the broad side like this. Ooh, not like that, but you know, to get, to fill in a larger area faster. You can use the corners to kind of get finer lines. These are very dense because there's just so much pigment. You know, you don't have the wood casing. If you think about how much thinner the core is to this, you know, you're working with a lot here. A little goes a long way. And then again, you can wash it out. I like to use these for thinner washes. And something else you can do, you can do splatter effects with these. Just lift a little and flick. So that's fun. That's very much like regular watercolor. So you can get many different effects. And you can do that with the pencils as well. A lot of people like to, like, see, flick it against... Look at that. So that's another way you can use the pencil. So you don't need to have both. I have both because I like collecting art supplies, <laughs> but also it's just a little bit more convenient for me. So here is, you know, how it washes out the lines really well there. Another way that I use these is by using them like a watercolor pan. Like I mentioned before, this is why I don't have the pan set because I just use my blocks like that. And similar to the the pencils, you can color it elsewhere if you wanted to. Pick it up, lift it, bring it somewhere else. I like to I like to use them similar to Sumi ink. Sorry, this is all upright. My my table isn't flat in case you can't tell gravity. But I just, I wet an area on a palette like you would with an ink stone. Actually, I kind of want to get an ink stone and try it with these. Very similar to Sumi ink sticks and it's very, very pigmented and dense. And then you just lift it up. and put it on your paper. And that's a great way to mix too, if you wanted to mix two colors together. You can do it on the palette. You 
normally I don't work with my palette on my table. So there are many ways, and I typically, my favorite way is to just use it like a pan, but I also do like to use the palette method. And again, that other plastic palette that I had will work the same way for these as they will the pencils. Look at that, and it's already layering, and it's kind of moving into it. And they are similar in the fact that you can do some wet on wet techniques like watercolors. So might be going into my project area now at this point. But if you want the watercolor effects, you have them. So you can work really, really light. And once that dries, since it's not going to lift, you can come right back over it. And that layer below is going to stay right there. Whereas with that, I mean, that will just pretty much annihilate it <laughs> or mix in. So that's, you know, that's my favorite, one of my favorite ways to work is I usually do light layers using my, my blocks as pans. And then I'll come back with my pencils for details or for the smaller areas, I'll come in with my pencil and then wash that out as well. But for broader areas, the blocks are really convenient. Again, you can do the same thing with your pencil, but it's a smaller core, so it'll take a little bit longer to fill broader areas, but it can be done very, very versatile. Oh, that's my watercolor pencil. I'm like, why is that not showing up? See, <laughs> even, even the pencils dry are a little bit more vibrant. And then you can just wash it out. And I believe you can also use other watercolor techniques while they're still wet. Some of the fun, like, like salt techniques and things like that. I don't have salt on hand, but I'm, I think I've done that with ink tents before. So that's something you can play around with. If you have a background in watercolor, try it out. It doesn't hurt. Just see what works. Okay. So I am going to, I might need to get a different piece of paper to do a fun little project on. I will be right back momentarily. Hi, future editing Shanna here. I just wanted to drop this in here. This is a scan of the leaf that I will be drawing for the project. Feel free to screenshot it if you want to draw the same leaf. I figured I would put it in this way because at times when I'm filming, it can be hard to see the leaf and it's kind of at a funny angle. Also, I wanted to let you know that the main colors that I'm using for this are vermilion, fern green, tan, sap green, magenta, matter brown, and light olive. So yeah, back to our regular programming. Okay, so I'm back and I have a different piece of paper. I decided it would be fun to work on a nice fall leaf. So I'm hoping that this angle will help you to see what I'm doing with my pencil better than the overhead angle. But something that I wanted to show you as well, if you get these, you wanna make sure you swatch them out. Maybe on a scrap piece of paper first, because this is a good example. This is the tan, but the core of it almost looks a little bit green. So the tips of them are supposed to be what the color looks like when it's washed out. So the core of it looks different than when it's washed out. So if you look, I don't know if you can see. Obviously, this part is tan, but this part looks quite green and a lot darker. So just swatch out your colors and see it actually is more of a mustard yellow closer to what this shows when it actually comes out. So that's just something to be aware of. You want to just swatch things out as with any other art supply, at least before you start working, even if you're not somebody who does a bunch of swatches ahead of time. So I am going to kind of, it kind of goes off like this. Now this is not going to be perfect. It's just an example of how I work with these. So I'm going to draw it out in pencil first and I'm using my lighter color that I can find because it has like some green in here that kind of turns tan. So that's the lighter color that I can find and I am not going to try and make this the most photorealistic leaf that I've ever seen. I am just going to kind of have fun with it. It helps when you're drawing a leaf to put in the center first and then kind of 
work out how these the direction that the other veins go in and then that will help you kind of decide where the little like pokey spines of the sides are kind of looks like a little weird christmas tree at the moment Just kind of looking at the edge there. And again, like this is something that's natural. It doesn't have to be perfect. And in lieu of time, it definitely won't be. Now, ordinarily, I would sketch mine out in a different place, like on a, you know, on a different scrap piece of paper. So I wouldn't have to worry about like if this was going to be a finished piece, I would have it sketched out first. And then I would transfer it to my good drawing paper. I wouldn't draw it directly on here. Just because I'm risking ruining the paper that way. If I wanted to erase and stuff. There's a little one here. This one comes like that, I think. This side comes up a little above the rest. This is such a weird kind of break. Nobody's going to know if this is perfect. <laughs> and it definitely is not going to be perfect. Uh, well, you'll know because you're watching. <laughs> but, like, this is just a test material. So I am so far from concerned about it being the perfect leaf. I think I made this side a little too long. Even that is weird. This comes up like that. See, I see like I am I'm spending way too much time on that aspect of it. Here I am like I'm not concerned if it's perfect and then I'm like, "Oh look. It's not right." Some of these lines can be washed away anyway. So, all right, there we go. We have our perfectly imperfect leaf. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my lightest color first. I'm going to start with the leaf's core color. And that is what you're seeing underneath all this red because originally this leaf was green. So we know that this tannish green kind of color was its base color. And then the red came later on. So I'm going to start with that base color with this lumpy little leaf. And I'm just really lightly, lightly scrubbing the tip of the pencil, very sharp tip, across the paper. And the perspective of this leaf is going to look funny to you because of the funny camera angle. So it, as lumpy as it looks to me, it may even look worse to you because... <laughs> It's at a funny angle, so the perspective is going to be thrown off a little bit, but this is just so you can kind of see my pencil strokes a little bit more easily. Then I'm going to come in with my wet brush. And it's going to turn into this really light wash. Now, if the veins of this leaf were lighter than the rest of the leaf, I would be using a stylus to indent the paper. So if they were going to stay that green color and not turn red, then I would be indenting my paper with a stylus, which makes it so I can keep that color that was below. Now, if you don't have a stylus, that's all right. You can use, if you have a pen that has run out of ink, you can use that. If you have a mechanical pencil with no lead in it, now this isn't clean, so it's probably going to make marks, but if you have a mechanical pencil with no lead in it, you can make those indents as well. You see that? 
You just want to make sure it's clean before it, like mine's not clean, but I'm not concerned about this piece of paper. So you don't have to go out and buy special tools if you don't have the money to do it. Use whatever you have laying around the house. If you have a ballpoint pen that's, you know, been dead for a good amount of time, but you haven't had the heart throw it out yet, that'll be perfect. So now for the reds, I am going to use my vermilion because I don't have any red ink tents anymore because they were not light fast. So now when I talk about light fastness with ink tents, it's all kind of relative because Derwent has not tested them wet. So they have their light fast ratings on there. And I believe they say about 80% of the line is light fast. And I, of course, as I mentioned, I went according to the Colored Pencil Society of America's light fast ratings. And I don't know that they tested them wet either. So the ratings that they go by are what they are when they're dry. Now, granted, if a pigment is light fast, it should be light. The pigment still remains light fast. Where it becomes an issue are the ones that are kind of in between, not necessarily the fugitive ones, because if they're fugitive when they're dry, you want to throw them out because they're definitely going to be fugitive wet. But if a pigment is light fast, it's light fast regardless. It's just a matter of the ones that are in between, the ones that are going to last 50 years as opposed to 100, they might fade in 20 years instead of 50 once they've been watered down because the pigment is distributed further apart from one another and it's not as protected by the binder, which is like one reason why acrylics tend to have pretty good light fast ratings for the most part. Of course, if the pigment isn't light fast, it isn't light fast, but acrylics don't seem to fade as quickly as watercolors, even if it's the same pigment. So it's something to keep in mind. If the pigment is light fast to begin with, it should stay light fast. But if it's kind of in between it and has the potential to fade, most likely it will fade quicker when it's been washed out with water. So now I'm going to come in with some blocks. So I kind of want to give this more of a green tint. But this is going to be so dense because this is kind of an opaque color. So... Just kind of wash it out as much as possible. Again, I want it to be very light. And I'm okay with those lines kind of going away a little bit. I'll still be able to see them enough to do what I want as far as detail goes. But yeah, so normally I'll go in, I'll get my preliminary sketch done, whether I do it with the intense pencils or I do it on a separate piece of paper and then transfer it and then I'll come in with washes. So as I was talking about, I don't have red, but a great way to mix a red, and yes, red can be mixed, magenta and yellow will make a red. which are two of the printer primaries, I think they call them. See, so you got a nice red there. And then I can brush this on similarly as I would regular watercolor. I can do line work with my brush if I want to. If I want it to be a little bit more of a cooler red, I just add a little bit more of the magenta. That's a little bit more similar to what I have. And the beginning stages always look messy. They go through a lot of ugly stages. But then you can come in with the pencils later and kind of bring it all together. So this is more red in the center. I should just bring my palette over. So I want to kind of get some of this red 
in here. And again, this is warping a lot more than I would like. If I were planning on having this be a finished piece that, you know, you know, something spectacular. <laughs> but normally, so normally I would be taping the whole paper down. The edges tend to be a little bit darker too. All very, very light in the beginning. And I just keep layering until I get it to the point I like. Sometimes I bring the pencils back. And then saturate it more. My vermilion. Vermilion will also, this is very, very close to red. It's a red-orange. So I can mix my magenta with that as well and get a red. But generally speaking, if you were to have, for some reason, you were to only have in a different like art style, like different art material, if you, for some reason, were to get just magenta and yellow as the primaries, some people prefer to work that way. Magenta, cyan, and yellow. Then you can mix red. You can mix red from yellow and magenta. And I like mixing my colors anyways, generally speaking. Bring this color in. And this is popping up kind of weird. I'm using small circular motions because it's kind of got that mottled texture there. So I'm just kind of mimicking the texture. And I think I'm going to bring in brown, kind of a warmer brown here for the more dark areas. And they layer well enough that, you know, they're kind of transparent. And so I can get that color and then use it with my vermilion to darken it. And then kind of come in with this yellow or tan, as they call it, over it. And then to keep that mottled texture there, I'm just blotting my brush on it. And this doesn't have to be a flat brush to do this. It's just the closest brush that I had near me. I don't know what happened to my round one I was just using. So, oh, it's in my hand. Ha! Well, that'll do it. And then it can kind of keep that texture and then move on while it's still wet. If you want, you can bring in these, that mottled kind of texture again. Alternating between colors. That's really dark. See how I was telling you? When it's wet, it'll get really, really dark. So this isn't meant to be the perfect piece. This is meant to show you what these pencils do and what their limitations can be and what their versatility can be. And kind of how to create texture. And you can create texture with the blocks as well if you wanted to some of that model texture here there's some lines that like to go this way in that picture i'm mean, in that picture <laughs> on the leaf i mean it's not a picture of a leaf it's an actual leaf that i grabbed from my yard And then just dab it with the brush. So there's many ways to create this kind of modeled overlay texture. Bring some of this brown in. And it doesn't look exactly like the leaf and that's fine. This is just a fun project to do to try out materials. I'm going to bring in this fern green color. Bring, back, bring it back to life a little bit. I want to do an overlay of my tan again. And at this point, 
I'm working section by section. And the sections can end up running together. It's similar to watercolor that way. Like if you accidentally touch your brush against something that's still wet, you might get marks in places you don't want. In this project, it's not that big of a deal because it's got all these little different textures anyway, so nobody's really going to notice as much. And then I just put too much there. I'm just going to, while it's still wet and while there's enough pigment there, kind of bring it down a little. So there is some lifting that can be done, but you just got to catch it at the right time. And sometimes it's about redistributing the pigment into different parts of your picture. Bringing some of that green in. I think I want to do kind of a mixture here. Very lightly here. And bring my tan back in. Saturate it some more because it dries a little bit lighter. Very similar to watercolor in that way too. Still dries a little bit more dense, I think, than the watercolors do. Like a little bit more vibrant than the watercolor pencils, I should say. Not than, you know, we're not talking about Daniel Smith watercolors here. I mean, we're talking about watercolor pencils, but. I'm gonna come through. And now that my pencil's kind of dull, I'm letting it do the work for me on the texture of the paper. See how you get that kind of grainy look? That can come in handy with pencils. That's one of the things that's great about pencils. Sometimes you want that look, but only if it's for a specific texture. See how it's kind of giving me that that side's a little too wet for me to do that on, but it's all right. We'll just come in with our brush and fix it up a little bit. So this is a lot of how I do things. I go back and forth. Usually light layers. I usually let them dry a little longer than I am in this video. Right now, I'm in a cool climate. And so... It's not taking as long. It's a cool, dry climate. It's not taking as long to dry. I'm going to like wash this out a little bit more, too, because now I like that side better. I put two dark of lines. It's almost like a do's and don'ts side. See? Look at that. We're learning every day. We're learning every moment of this video. Bring the lines back in. This has a lot more red on this side. Just relayer. And you can use some paper towel to kind of dry the paper a little bit too in places. Or if you look here, there's a lot of pigment over here. I'm actually able to lift in those wet areas. So you can to a degree. I hadn't let it dry completely yet before I added more water and the pigment hadn't been completely washed out. And so that's why I was able to lift. So there are times that you can correct it. I'm dropping pencils everywhere, as you can probably hear. But it still doesn't lift as permanently. I'm gonna come back in and kind of give it that texture again. It got too dark because I didn't wait for it to dry. But that's perfect because you needed to see that's what happens when you don't wait for it to dry. So now I've got a little bit of mud over there. This one is like super wet right now from the paper. So now I want to come in and bring some of that green in there, but I don't need to bring it everywhere. I 
They do have a pencil in here that's called an outliner and it's a non-water soluble pencil. So if you wanted to do outlines or you want to do some type of illustration, it to me, I'm pretty sure it is a graphite pencil. So I don't typically use it very much. I prefer to just keep the look of the ink tents themselves, the colorful ones. But it could be convenient for those who do illustration more often than I do. When I do illustration though, I typically just do my black outlines after with a pit pen. Or, you know, just a fine liner, a black fine liner. Continuing that mottled texture. See how I'm using really small scribbles. And I'm not copying the leaf exactly. If I were to slow down and really do it, obviously it would look better, but I'm using these small circles because there's little veins inside there that kind of do that. And it looks like on this side, we're darker. It's darker around the veins and then lighter in the middle of each of these blades. So it's almost like shading the edges of each of these blades. And that's what I'm going with. But I'm using small circular motions and I'm letting my pencil jump across the texture of the paper a lot. Very, very light hand. This is a lot darker down here. There's a lot more red. So I'm going to do that to shade it. This side is still wet in some spots, so I got to be careful there. But I'm bringing that color back. Darker here. Occasionally they come out this way. So basically, as you can see, it's just me repeating light layers and then coming through. With my pencil and you can do it with or without blocks. And you can come through. Like I said, if I wanted to do the whole thing in blocks, I could. You can get some detailed edges. It's just harder to see. For me, it's harder to control. But you know, it's got corners and there are some people who like to sharpen their blocks down and make actual ridges, like actual kind of pencil tip with them. I find the pencils to be a little bit more versatile than the blocks for my working style just because they can do, you know, pretty much everything as far as de fine detail goes for my working style. But if you're somebody who's used to working with blocks and any sort of other media and you have been able to get fine detail, or if you are somebody who doesn't want fine detail in their work, blocks are great for that as well because they cover broader areas. Now, this obviously isn't as photorealistic as my leaf, my leaves in my recent apple piece. Now I'm just blotching because I want to keep a lot of that texture. I'm blotting off my paintbrush so it's not completely wet and I'm just blotching in areas. See, and it kind of gives that leaf texture even more. I want to go around this edge though and darken that. When there's still like a lot of dense color, it really just pops when you wet it like it just I can't even imagine like I couldn't imagine before I got them I was like I was so thrilled when I tried these for the first time and saw how vibrant they were when I wet them down but you really have to keep that in mind because like I was used to things that were far less vibrant and so it took me a little bit to get used to that and then I want to bring in just a little light olive green 
in the areas here, the green areas, just to make it pop a little. Yeah, that's the basic gist of it. Like pretty much light layers when I'm working with the pencil, I'm working in light layers and then I'm washing it out into lighter layers and then they get progressively darker as I go. Um, when I get to the details is when I use my most dense pencil strokes. And then obviously I like using multiple light layers one on top of the other to get the color of the saturation that I'm looking for and to kind of create some depth. And now I'm just kind of going in and darkening these and refining them. This is where I would normally go through and see if there's more little veins in between and just refine things a little bit more. This edge, this edge though, and that's not even from me like going out of the lines with, <laughs> with the water. Like I went out of the lines coloring, like that's like kindergarten stuff there, but... But yeah, so that's my fun little project. It's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but I hope that you learned something from this and you learned something from the initial swatches. If you have any more questions about these about this product, please let me know in the the comment section below if there's anything specific that you're wondering that I didn't cover in this video, any techniques or anything. I will try to answer your questions. I just really love this product and I know a lot of people wanted me to do something that was a little bit more beginner friendly and I'm hoping that this video does that for you and yeah so thank you so much for watching have a great day bye hey guys thanks for watching if you like what you see please hit subscribe also if you're interested in seeing more of my artwork I'm on social media so check out the links in the description below